Hey there, Chad here, continuing our exploration of the Kerbal Space Program universe. Now, at the end of the previous video, we had collected a few science points, and initially I thought we'd spend those right away, but let's go ahead and run a couple of more relatively simple missions, including escaping the atmosphere or, or performing suborbital flight. Also, we're going to run one of these tests real quick. I think it's important to learn how this works because it can be a little confusing. So in the contracts, every once in a while, you'll get one that says to test something, test the heat shield in this case, or test the swivel engine. And it gives specific circumstances that have to be met in order for that to happen. The ones that say at the launch site are extremely easy. These don't require almost anything. There's literally, you click a button called run test and you've executed the contract. Uh, in this case, it's the heat shield. We don't have access to the heat shield yet in our tech tree. That will be coming relatively quickly, but when we run a test, they give us a part to test, which makes some sense. In this particular case, we simply have to be on Kerbin at the launch site. That's all this contract's going to take. It isn't a very lucrative contract, but it gives us a little bit of cash. And again, it allows us to demonstrate how run test works. So I'm going to accept that contract. Gene is excited about that. We'll go into the vehicle assembly building and we're going to build an extremely simple test vehicle. So what we will do is we will have a command pod. Uh, we don't have to do anything to it. All we're going to do is add the heat shield. This is the heat shield that we want to test. You'll notice that it says in the window there, experimental. So that's important to know. And we'll drop that right on here. Now, one thing I'm going to demonstrate about heat shields real quick. They use a substance called ablator, and that's what sloughs off the heat. This size heat shield, you can set that up to 200. Now, the thing is, is it's heavy. Uh, and in general, when you're going into space, you want to take as little extra weight as you need. In this particular case, we don't actually even need the heat shield. Uh, if we were to launch this, we are not actually going to launch this. But if we were, with what we'll be doing in this episode, we really wouldn't need a heat shield anyway. So setting it as low as possible, in this case, 20 is the lowest it could be set where it actually is still effective saves us quite a bit of weight. I believe it is uh, a kilogram per, per setting. So that starts to add up pretty quickly. In this case, it's only 200. The larger heat shields though go up to 800. And then you're starting to talk about some serious weight and a lot of fuel that you're not taking because you're taking other stuff. Not entirely important for right now, that part, but one other thing we're going to do is just to demonstrate how some of this snaps together and some of the things we can do. I'm going to add this little segment at the bottom here. And that is going to be our test harness. We're literally going to take that to the launch pad and it's going to sit there. You'll note there was no engine on there. We just have the capsule there so Jeb can sit in it very little control of what he can do and it's sitting on this little frame on the launch pad to run the test we right click on the heat shield and you'll notice we get jettison heat shield which allows us to drop it we don't want to do that and we have this run test button usually this won't be there but because we have selected a test contract it is there and we're going to click it and that is it you'll notice immediately the contract complete alert came up and it says we completed the contract. That is literally it. We just ran a test, we just completed a contract. So I'm gonna go ahead and recover that vessel. Uh, we collected a few funds from the returned parts because they were sitting on the launch pad. They were worth 100% of their salvage value. And Jeb gained no experience from that, which makes a little bit of sense. Okay, so on to our suborbital flight. We will go into the vehicle assembly building. We can get rid of this, won't need that. So we're going to start with a capsule and let's close that. We don't need to see that right now. One thing I have done is I have turned on Kerbal Engineering Redux and it gives some information about the build of the rocket as, as we move through it. I'm not going to go into any detail with that right now, uh, but it's something you're going to see on some of these videos now and I will call out specifically what I'm looking at on that when I start to use it. 
this particular mission really won't need it. We are going to add a parachute to the top. And then what I want to do is add some science so we can collect a few more points. I'm going to grab the mystery goo and I want to put three of those on. So if you recall from a previous episode, hitting the X key gives you the symmetrical uh, addition and that should be three of them. So we'll drop those right there and I'm also going to add three thermometers. Um, kind of putting them here because I don't want them on the door of the the capsule. So we'll just kind of drop that right here and as you can see it added three of those and we are not blocking the door. That's all we really need to do there. Now the other thing we're going to do is we're going to build a staged rocket. This is going to have multiple stages. First of all we want to add a decoupler so that we can return the capsule all by itself. Then we're going to add the upper stage and for that I'm going to add three of these fuel tanks. Uh, I just added one. I can hit Alt and click it and it'll give me the same part. Uh, and I can do that again. When you do use Alt and click, it will give you everything that's highlighted. So this would actually give me two more fuel tanks. I actually only want one more for a total of three. But if I wanted four, I could have clicked a little higher and that would have given me a, a it would have given me the entire stack. We're going to add the swivel engine, which we did purchase last time we were out there in space. And we are going to then add another decoupler for the lower stage or the, the, the first stage of the rocket. Now, in this particular case, I'm going to use a solid rocket engine. So it calls it the Hammer Solid Fuel Booster. And we're going to put that guy right here. Now, this should all work just fine. It should, it should fly pretty well, but there will be a little bit of stability problems. There's a lot of weight at the top. There's a lot of friction at the top with the added goo canisters. So to help with that, I'm going to add some fins. And I'm going to put them in two different places. First, I'm going to put three fins down here at the very bottom of the solid rocket booster. Then secondly, I'm going to add three more fins on the upper stage, right about here, so that when we separate our rocket, we will have, we will continue to have some control. So if we look at our staging real quick, we'll back out just a little bit. We have our solid rocket booster, then we have that separator or decoupler. Then we have our liquid rocket engine, another decoupler, and then the top stage will have the parachute. So our staging looks good. Let's give this a try. Our goal for this particular mission is suborbital flight. Suborbital flight will require us to reach an altitude of 70,000 meters or above. We can go probably with this rocket, we could probably make it to about 130 to 150 kilometers we only need to go to 70. Uh, we're going to aim for about 75 just to be above the, the, the threshold there so that we're clearly out of the atmosphere. And we're going to talk about some of the dynamics of the atmosphere as we fly through it here. We are not going to necessarily use all the fuel. I'm not sure if we'll need to or not. We probably won't need it all. So we're going to waste a little bit, but I don't know exactly how much. So we're just going to take what we need for now. I'm going to turn on stability because I always do. I tend to turn on the light. This rocket starts with the solid rocket booster, which is not throttleable, but I am going to go ahead and set the throttle to 100% for our second stage. We are going to probably fly the rocket a little bit with the throttle once we get up there though. And we'll talk about the aerodynamics of the atmosphere and what, what is going on as we fly through it. I will point this out real quick. You'll notice there's some color bands here on the atmosphere. The top of the meter on the far left is when you have exited the atmosphere. The different color segments kind of demonstrate the density of the atmosphere in those locations. So in the lower atmosphere, the air is very dense. So for any thrust we're giving, we are having to push against the air quite a bit. Now in fluid dynamics, one of the things to know is as something moves through the medium faster, more resistance is applied. So if you think about a diver diving into water, 
when you jump from from three feet you don't feel a lot of force but you slow down pretty quick if you dive in from three meters you definitely perceive more force but you also still don't go terribly deep you do go a little deeper but not a whole lot water exerts more resistance the faster something enters it the same is true of air air the faster something moves more resistance is applied so when we're in the lower atmosphere for all the thrust we're giving it we're, we're actually opposing a tremendous amount of, of frictional resistance from the air it isn't a bad idea when you have the opportunity and with a solid booster we don't but once we get to the the throttleable rocket i'm going to back it down a little bit so we're we're spending less energy fighting that friction just a, just a little bit we're not going to turn it all the way off or anything but we're going to back it down a little just to save a little bit of fuel until we're in the the thinner part of the atmosphere where it's not as as noticeable so let's go ahead and launch this guy i'm going to hit space and we are going to go i'm going to lean it over a little bit so that we ultimately hit the water. The solid rocket fuel will burn until it is done and we have no control over that whatsoever. So we're just along for the ride. One thing I am gonna do right now, I forgot to do before we launched, is I'm gonna turn on this uh, here and now part of science. And what it will do is it will pop these up. Okay, we're at the end of our first stage. Separate and I'm gonna launch the next stage and I'm immediately gonna throttle down to about half throttle. I'm going to do that until we're out of this section here. So what I started to say about the science here now is you'll notice these start popping up and I can run these experiments just by clicking them over here. It makes it a lot easier than hunting around trying to find the, the experiment at any particular time. Also, it tells me how many points I'm going to get if I run it right then. So I don't have to kind of memorize all that. And that's kind of nice. We'll go ahead and run one of those. Get that out of the way. Now you'll notice we're going to top out at 82,000 feet already, so we still have a good amount of fuel, but we don't really need to use any more because I really only have to get to 70,000 meters. I said feet, I meant to say meters. We're going to hit 82,000, but you'll also notice that that's dropping quickly. That's because it's calculating in the resistance from the air. Once we actually leave the atmosphere, this number will stop ticking down. It'll be steady because there's no resistance being applied, slowing the rocket down. To, to limit that height. Kind of a neat little thing about how the physics engine in the game actually works is it's continuing to, to measure these kinds of things. You'll notice it's slowed way down because we're at the very top of the atmosphere. There's very little wind resistance right now. It's still measurable, but it's very, very light. You'll also notice we have a couple of experiments we can still run. I'm gonna go ahead and run temperature you could do the crew report now. I'm going to wait till he's in space, which is going to be in just a matter of a few seconds now. And there we go. We crossed into space. You may have noticed the screen jumped a little bit, and that's because we changed our, uh, I don't know what they call it, but we changed a status, so to speak, and it, it kind of notifies us that way. It also changed this from surface to orbit, I believe. Might have to go back and look at that. Uh, but those are two different ways we can look at our our relative velocity right now. So we're still going up. We're going to go up for about another 4,000 meters, about 3,000 now. You'll notice the crew report is now worth five points. That's because we are in space. If we click it, it will say we're in space near Kerbin. Go ahead and keep that. I'm going to go ahead and run all these because why not? We can run mystery goo for 10. If I have another mystery goo, I think I do. You'll notice the re diminishing returns. I could run it again right now for 2.3 points. Um, I'm going to hold off on that. We'll probably run another mission in the very near future where we can hit that if we need to. There may be more points uh, collectible as we go back down. One last thing, we're now descending. And one thing I didn't do is separate the top stage. And I could have done that. I'm going to go ahead and do that now. And there's a little explosive charge to give us the separation. So we gained a little bit of thrust effectively. And that's why we're seeing this appear to fall away which it is actually doing now, we are falling. Uh, it's moving a little faster than us because of that explosive charge. Uh, this will stay, the, the acceleration here will stay relatively constant compared to our capsule, but eventually it'll, it'll be a kilometer away before we, we actually end up hitting the water with our parachute open. 
he'll hit the water a little harder than we will. It is possible if it starts to spin or, or, or slide sideways or something, we could catch up with it again because it could start to experience more wind resistance. Uh, if it's sideways, for instance, it's got more surface area, it'll slow down faster. We're in a, a fairly aerodynamic uh, direction, it's at least the way we want to be because we're going to want to decelerate. Uh, it could experience more deceleration and we would catch up with it and potentially even pass it. And we're crossing 50,000 meters or 50 kilometers. One thing I do like to sometimes do is just zoom way out and get a better idea of the, uh, just the immensity of this little bitty planet that is so much smaller than ours. During launches, you get a nice tail that you can watch too, and that's, that's pretty neat. We probably will not get a fireball re-entry re, uh, re here. Uh, I don't think we're gonna be going fast enough. And, Got target selected now because I double clicked on something. Getting a little bit, I guess you see a little bit of it, but I don't think it's going to get really superheated where we get a big glow. Uh, and you'll notice it's even going away. We are decelerating very quickly now because we can hit a thicker part of the atmosphere and this is going to fall off very, very fast. I will hit the stage for the parachute when we hit about 270 meters per second. That's roughly the safe zone for the parachute. I actually haven't seen the parachute tear off before, uh, at least not when being relatively responsible. And, hit it. and you'll notice this deceleration will kind of speed up because it does offer some drag as it's going. I'm also gonna turn this off. No, needs, no need for it anymore. As we cross down under 5,000 meters, uh, the speed is gonna drop off dramatically because that thicker air is, is slowing us down more and more and the parachute will bloom at about a thousand meters, probably hit about 800 meters before it's fully open. And then we will fall slowly into the ocean. You'll notice we still could run that, that mystery goo experiment. I'm gonna go ahead and do it. I think we've already exhausted. Well, we'll wait till we hit the water. We'll see what happens when we hit the water. So actually it didn't fully blossom for about 500 meters. That's, it's actually still growing. So almost 600 meters. Something to note, but we are falling at a very safe speed now. Anything under six meters per second is, you could land on the ground at six meters per second. Uh, in real life, if you were to do that, it would probably hurt, but it also probably wouldn't kill you. Let's go ahead and accelerate time using the period on the keyboard. Move it up to four times. And as we cross down under, say, 30 meters, I'll kill that. There we go. We see our shadow and splash down. Here, splash down in Kerbin's water. And we do have one more mystery goo we can run there for four. I'll go ahead and do that. And I will keep the experiment. And now we don't have any operational experiments. All of our experiments that it would suggest running and that would be anything that would give us more than 0.1 points of science they're either exhausted or there's they're below that threshold or some other reason but we, we can't run them is what it means so jeb is ready to return home we will hit recover vessel and we are going to see what kind of science we collected we collected a ton of science this time we collected 56 science points which nearly doubled. In fact, it did double what we had available to us. So this was a very profitable outing from a science perspective. We can look through here and see exactly what we collected. Uh, I don't need that level of detail in my life. Hit next and it will show us the part collection. You'll notice our funds went up a good amount here. And then we will see that once again, Jeb earned no experience for what he did. In our next flight, we're going to go for an orbit. We're going to try to maintain orbit, and he should start to gain points once we do an orbit, and that'll be very helpful. Thanks for joining me on this episode, and fair travels.